Hey there, everybody. Today we're going to... Wait, something... Something's not right here. Do I have spots? Okay, so, um, took some phone calls and a little witchery to get that sorted, but uh, I think we're good now. Something's not right here. Or, you know, at least I'm where I'm supposed to be, which that's all I really care about. You know what's been on my mind for the last month and a bit? Body swaps. Some of you might have guessed that Wonder Woman 1984 and the uh, kerfuffle over how the character of Steve Trevor was brought back to life is what got me thinking about all this. And while that is what kicked this whole thought process off, body swapping is a pretty well-worn trope both film and television, it's been around for a while. The original Freaky Friday from 1976 can probably be credited with popularizing the concept, but it goes back as far as at least 1830 in written works and probably even further back in folklore and fairy stories. Yet, in all that time, I've personally never seen a body swap film or a TV show spark the kind of heated conversation that Wonder Woman 1984 did. And I found myself thinking about that quite a bit and really wondering about the ethical questions that these sorts of stories almost always ignore and also how basically every body swap story before this got away with it while Wonder Woman didn't. Now, before we get too far into the weeds on this, let me be very clear. This isn't meant to be taken all that seriously. I am not trying to ruin anyone's favorite piece of entertainment. I'm not here to tell you that you cannot ethically watch Freaky Friday or Shrek the Third or Your Name. I just find it interesting to ask the questions that these stories really don't want you asking. Questions about consent, bodily autonomy, endangerment, defamation, fraud, and, yes, even rape. So if applying that kind of lens to what is usually meant to be a very silly trope, nearly always employed for harmless fun, then, you know, maybe this isn't the video for you. That out of the way, how about we define our terms a little bit? One of the nice things about body swapping is that the name of the trope is almost all you need to know as far as explanation goes. The, uh, oh, oh boy, um... The mind? Soul? Uh, let's go with consciousness. So, that thing of two people get switched and they find themselves in each other's bodies. Hijinks to follow. The mechanisms for the switch will vary. It's usually fantastical or supernatural in nature. There are technological justifications sometimes, but they're not nearly as common. Sometimes these events take place in an already fantastical setting, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Gravity Falls, Farscape, but the swap can also be a single fantastical element in an otherwise realistically grounded story, as in Freaky Friday, The Hot Chick, and The Change Up. I suspect that some of you might have tilted your heads when I said that Wonder Woman 1984 got me thinking about all this, because that wasn't really a clean body swap. Steve didn't have a body anymore. He was dead. So yes, he takes over another man's body, but we don't know what happened to the other guy's consciousness during that stretch of time, and Steve didn't have a body for it to be in. If you're thinking that sounds more like possession... Well, you are technically correct. The best kind of correct. But the actual results of this shares more features with body swap stories than your standard possession story. The thing about possession is that it's nearly always malevolent and instigated by the possessor. It's almost never an accident, whereas body swaps are most commonly involuntary in some way, either by being a complete accident or an unintended consequence of something else. There are exceptions, and I'll tackle a few of those, but my point is, regardless of the logistics, Steve's presence in this man's body raises the same kinds of ethical questions that any body swap story does, so I'm still going to reference it across this video. There are also some odd body swap adjacent tropes, such as the time jump self swap, where someone's consciousness is leapt forward or back in time to possess their own older or younger self. Think X-Men Days of Future Past or 13 Going Out 30. I won't be including those in this conversation because taking possession of your own body avoids most of the questions I'm going to be bringing up in this video. 
I just wanted to give it a token acknowledgement because it's this weird little subcategory and I noticed it was a thing and it was taking up space in my brain and I will not have the only brain cells wasted on this thing. Gosh darn it. But when body swap plot lines occur, they are nearly always without the consent of those who trade bodies. And it's almost always an accident of some kind. When it isn't accidental, then the person who caused it is always either a villain or someone trying to teach the characters who swap some kind of lesson. But accidental is by far the most common. So let's start there. Given the involuntary nature, there's actually an initial innocence to it because the people involved didn't mean for this to happen. So at the very least, they are not responsible for the circumstances. How badly things go off the rails after that is going to vary on a case-by-case basis. Ultimately, the big issue at play when talking about ethical ramifications of body swap is that of losing your bodily autonomy. Someone is doing things with your body that you cannot prevent and have no say over. But of course, it's probably not realistic for swappies to just stay in one place and do nothing and hope it fixes itself. If nothing else, they usually have to try and reverse what happened. So... Obviously, things are going to occur with your body that you aren't in control of pretty much no matter what. So there's going to be kind of a low-level background radiation, kind of creepy. And whether or not that level jumps up over the baseline, uh, it's going to depend on what one character does with the other's body and whether or not it's something the other is A, aware of, and B, would be okay with. Think of it this way. If you lost consciousness for whatever reason, there is probably a small number of things you would be okay with people doing to your body, such as, say, safely carrying you to an unoccupied bedroom if they thought you needed to rest, or taking you to a hospital if it was more sudden. And that list of acceptable activities will probably be longer or shorter depending on your existing relationship with whatever person is doing the thing. But regardless, there's going to be a considerably longer list of things that you would not be okay with happening to your body while you're not in the driver's seat. Guys dream about this sort of thing. I'll tell you one thing, Crichton. If I find you've been dreaming anything else to my body, I'll break your legs, even if they are mine. So the question becomes, what do people get up to while in the other's body? Oh, and before anyone makes an argument along the lines of, well, in a swap, they both have control over the other, so doesn't that, you know, kind of balance out? No. No. No, it doesn't. That's just that's just the body swap equivalent of mutually assured destruction. It'd be like two people borrowing each other's cars. The fact that you could theoretically crash the other person's car if they end up crashing yours wouldn't actually make either of those events okay. So... When it comes to what another person gets up to in your body, the elephant in the room is going to be the fact that they have full and unfettered access to your junk. And that's the kind of thing that these stories tend to just gloss right over, which is probably for the best because acknowledging that tends to just bring attention to it. And annoyingly, most of the time when these stories do that in some way and draw attention to it. It's an attempt at comedy, which just shows a lack of tact and self-awareness. I got a vagina. I'm gonna explore that right now. Obviously, somebody groping your bits for their own enjoyment really isn't okay. Now, look, we can make allowances for basics like washing, going to the bathroom, but even those basics can get muddied if there's a clear intent to take advantage. Hey, I can look at myself naked. Then, there's the issue of engaging in sexual activity with another person, which brings us neatly back to Wonder Woman 1984. One of the big questions, and one of which I tackled in a way, coming out of that film was whether or not Diana committed rape by being sexually intimate with Steve while he was in that borrowed body. If we step out of that specific example, we actually find that the issue can even be bigger than that because it involved a third party in addition to the body swap people. If someone gets intimate while body swapped, then it's arguable that whoever they are getting it on with is not having sex with who they think they are. Because yes, rape by deception is in fact a thing. 
This is an issue rarely broached with any seriousness. And the prime example that I could think that really touched on it at all kind of botched it, like really bad. And that was the episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer from season four, when Faith, still definitely a villain at that point in time, forcibly swapped bodies with Buffy and then, among other things, had sex with Buffy's boyfriend. And looking back on it now, I find it more than slightly alarming that the big issue coming out of that was that Buffy felt hurt because Riley didn't realize it wasn't really her. There is literally zero discussion about the violation of Riley, and going back to rewatch it, it's, it's actually kind of startling. But while sexual contact and conduct might be the most in your face issue with body swapping, it's far from the only one. I mean, body swaps are a super common trope for one-off episodes of kids' cartoons. So, you know, that end of it is usually not going to come up. So what else is there? Well, I mentioned endangerment earlier, which is another time where Wonder Woman 1984 serves up a case in point of the problems. This man, whose name is never learned, by the way, and is only credited somewhat creepily as handsome man, didn't consent to having his body taken into dangerous situations and repeatedly thrown into fights. So now imagine that instead of touching your junk while you're unconscious, somebody's just repeatedly punching you in the face. So, unless the activity has been agreed to by whoever's body this really is, what right does someone have to put that body in physical or even mortal danger? The main way this usually gets skirted around is that the danger is the result of pursuing the means to reverse the swap. So, less analogous to being punched in the face full force and more akin to, you know, being smacked on the cheek, hoping that you'll wake up. Yes, it's physical harm, but it's in the pursuit of a goal that the body's original owner would want. Then, you know, that takes the curse off it a little bit, at least for most viewers. But we're not done yet because there's issues of fraud and defamation because somebody else running around in your body can pull all kinds of activities and easily ruin your reputation with friends, family, or co-workers. So, uh, I'll have my briefs on your desk by lunch. That puts my balls on your chin by dinner. That right there is schedule for sexual harassment. Awesome. Usually if this comes up, it's played for comedy like most other things with this trope, and it also tends to either get resolved by correcting the issue, or the characters actually decide that the consequences are, in fact, a good thing. Which, a bit like the endangerment angle, takes a, as long as it's all okay in the end, we don't have to question the fact about whether or not it should have happened in the first place approach. This is, again, unsurprisingly at this point, another thing that Wonder Woman 1984 opened the door to and then just didn't deal with at all. I swear I didn't intend this to be a knock on that movie, but it turned out that way. But we get a sense that Handsome Man did have a life of his own, of some form. The question of whether he has family or friends who might be worried about him or a job that he's supposed to be at or anything like that is just flat out never addressed Seriously, Wonder Woman, what the heck? When trying to figure out how so many shows and movies got away with doing body swap stories while rarely addressing any of these issues, I really started to wonder why Wonder Woman 1984 stepped in it so badly. Well, for one thing, it's actually a trope more commonly found in television than film. And as noted, nearly always employed comedically. Being on television, confined to episodes usually between 22 and 50 minutes long, means that there's far less screen time spent on the body swap, and that gives audiences less time to start asking questions. It's over too quick to start poking holes in it. Keeping a light comedic tone also helps divert, because if we're all just laughing and having fun, an audience is going to be less inclined to apply real-world seriousness onto what they're watching. Which is why you'd be hard-pressed to find a body swap film that isn't a comedy of some form. I genuinely think that these might be the factors as to why so many people were asking these questions about Wonder Woman 1984 specifically. Because that movie is two and a half hours long and fairly serious in tone. Which means viewers had more time to think about what was going on and more inclination to take it seriously and apply these kinds of questions to it. Ugh. That thing was a mess. I still enjoyed it, but geez. Before we wrap it up, uh, you may be wondering, 
has every single body swap story just ignored these issues and hoped audiences wouldn't notice? Has there ever been a body swap story that was at least aware of the ethical issues inherent in the trope on some level? Well, it's time to bring in the boys from the dwarf. Red Dwarf Series 3 had an episode fittingly titled Body Swap, where two of the lead characters swap bodies and the ethics of the situation are actually at the core of how the story plays out. Okay, so for people not acquainted with this show, what's wrong with you? Okay, seriously though, it's a future set, space-bound sci-fi comedy. The two characters involved are Dave Lister, the last human being alive. Arnold Rimmer, a hologram of his dead bunkmate. Now, when he was alive, Rimmer was a fitter man than Lister is, or ever was. Lister needs to get in better shape, and Rimmer is bemoaning the fact that as a hologram, he can't feel or touch things anymore. So they agree to a temporary swap, with the idea being that Rimmer will get Lister's body into shape and get the enjoyment of physical sensations again, and then they'll swap back. So... First off, this episode does benefit from the swap being planned as opposed to an accident, like nearly every other body swap movie or show ever. But more vitally than that, the two lay out a clear agreement as to what is and is not allowed to happen to Lister's body while Rimmer is in it. An agreement that Rimmer immediately breaks because the joy of taste and touch being part of his existence again sends him into a hedonistic bender, something that the show, even while playing it off for a laugh, makes immensely clear is wrong. Rimmer is unquestionably the villain in this scenario to the point that he actually steals Lester's body and almost kills it. A silly, campy British sci-fi sitcom took more time and effort to examine the ethics and frame the failure to live up to those ethics as a bad thing than a two and a half hour movie funded by one of the biggest entertainment entities in the world. Smegan hell. So, long story short, there are a ton of weird, creepy, and sometimes criminal implications when it comes to body swap stories, but since the premise is inherently funny, most stories ignore all of them and get away with it for being short or comical or both. And honestly, that may have been the most entertaining thing for me to pick over. Not the ethical conundrums of the premise, though I did have some fun with that, but rather taking a look at why the heck most stories seem to get away with it despite these questions. Because for all the times I've spent talking about problematic tropes, representation, and all that sort of thing, there are ways to mitigate inherent issues. There are ways to present these things that the audience is gently directed away from the ideas that make it uncomfortable, which is exactly what Wonder Woman 1984 failed to do. And sometimes you have to see something drop the ball on a concept this badly before it makes you appreciate how so many others actually make it work. I think that's about it. Starting to wonder if I should check in on Jesse. Are you f***ing kidding me? Yeah, I'm sure it's fine. Thank you for watching. If you like what I do, I have a Patreon, without the support of which I couldn't pay my bills and keep this whole thing going. And of course, I'd love to hear your comments about this. And uh, the old staples of like, share, and subscribe are a big help too. But you also don't have to do any of it. Because at the end of the day, you are the council. I'm just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned.